The Mariana Trench is a crescent-shaped trench in the Western Pacific, just east of the Mariana Islands near Guam. The trench contains the deepest known points on Earth, vents bubbling up liquid sulfur and carbon dioxide, as well as active mud volcanoes and marine life that adapted to pressures a thousand times that at sea level. But just how deep is the deepest part of the ocean? The Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the trench, also making it officially the deepest part of the ocean, was pegged at 36,070 feet, and was measured using sound pulses sent through the ocean from the surface and was conducted back in 2010 by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or the NOAA. It was initially believed that the bottom of the Mariana Trench was a vast, lifeless wasteland. The Greek philosopher Socrates, who lived 2400 years ago, apparently said, Everything is corroded by the brine, and there is no vegetation worth mentioning and scarcely any degree of perfect formation, but only caverns and sand and measureless mud and tracks of slime. In the Victorian era, this idea was championed by a scientist called Edward Forbes. He dredged the Aegean Sea and found that the deeper he looked, the fewer organisms he discovered. He concluded that life ceased to exist beyond 18,000 feet. Of course, these statements have long been disproven by science. Life, however sparse, exists down there, and the creatures living there are some of the weirdest creatures ever to have been discovered by science. They have evolved in such a way to make do of what the environment offers them. Long intro aside, today we will be answering the question what actually lives at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Let's not waste any more time, and with all that said and done, let's begin, shall we? Fish with flashlights. It's literally pitch black down there. In ideal conditions, sunlight may reach 3,280 feet below sea level, but usually peters out at around 656 feet. Given that fact, animals living down in the trench only have two choices, either evolve to not be dependent on light or produce their own light. Bioluminescence is the ability of creatures to produce their own light, used either for hunting or attracting a mate. Many creatures living in the trench have this ability to various degrees of intensity. Hatchetfish, for instance, have bioluminescent bodies. They can even alter the brightness of their glow depending on how much light is filtering from above. In doing so, they're counter-illuminating their bodies in a clever camouflage technique. Their dim, self-produced light reduces their silhouettes, making it much more difficult for predators to spot them from below. Dragonfish, also a resident of the deep, also relies heavily on bioluminescent body parts, which leverage internal chemical reactions to produce an eerie glow. The fish may use this glow to communicate with other fish or to provide camouflage. It also dangles a lighted barbel, or whisker-like protrusion, from its lower jaw. Other fish are attracted to the barbel, mistaking it for an easy meal. But in a flash, the dragonfish gets lunch instead. Some dragonfish also evolved the ability to produce a red glow, an unusual color of light for ocean dwellers. They may use their reddish hue to signal their brethren, but it's more likely that they're using the red lamp to illuminate prey just before launching an attack. And lastly, we go to probably the most famous inhabitant of the trench, the anglerfish. There are about 3,200 species of anglerfish, 160 of them are deepwater species. They are often called the fishermen of the deep sea, mainly because of a certain part of their anatomy and how they use it to catch prey. It has a protrusion from its forehead that dangles a glowing lure to attract starstruck, luckless animals. With its huge, gaping jaws, the anglerfish can actually devour creatures much larger than itself. Before we move on, I've got a little challenge for you that'll take five seconds to complete. So here's the deal. You just leave a like on this video, smash that subscribe button, and hit the notification bell, and you will get 25 years of amazing luck. Try it, it really works. A blast from the past. Prehistoric deep sea animals fared better than their shallow water counterparts. Living in the deep apparently allowed them to survive the many great extinctions that happened in the Earth's long history. While the Megalodon and the Mosasaurus ruled the prehistoric seas, they are easily trumped in longevity by their prehistoric denizens of the Mariana Trench. If you've ever seen the iconic movie Aliens, you've been haunted by dreams of toothy, bald creatures bursting from your chest and snapping at your face. Now picture a shark with just such a face swimming around in the darkest, deepest seas. That would be the Goblin Shark, an aptly named monstrosity from your worst nightmares. Goblin Sharks have a protruding snout that looks like a pointy sword. Just below the snout are a set of protruding jaws that appear to be mismatched with the shark's face, as if evolution spun the wheel of ugly and the Goblin Shark lost in the worst possible way. What's more, these sharks aren't your stereotypical gray color. Instead, their skin has a distinct pinkish hue. Then we have their cousin, the Frilled Shark. 
Thrill Sharks will cook a mix and match special from the discount aisle at your local Evolution convenience store. They have the rounded body of an eel paired with a flattened head that would likely be right at home atop a terrestrial dinosaur. Perhaps that's fitting though, because like many sharks, this species has ancient roots that extend back nearly 80 million years. The shark derives its name from six rows of frilly gills that grace its body, which grows up to six feet long. Just as notably, the shark wields more than 20 rows of wicked trident-shaped teeth that will tear into any bit of flesh that passes near them. For years, many people assumed that frilled sharks swam and hunted like eels. Some researchers think an awkward arrangement of internal organs would make that kind of movement impossible. Instead, they say these sharks may actually strike their prey with the action of a land-based snake, making them even weirder. Single-celled giants Single-celled organisms are tiny, well, usually tiny. In the Mariana Trench, however, tiny is not going to cut it for these single-celled animals. Called xenophyophores, they were first described in the 1970s. Originally thought to be sponges, they were later identified as single gigantic cells and classified as members of the kingdom Protista, along with other single-celled organisms and simple multicellular life, lacking specialized tissues. Genetic studies have identified the xenophyophores as a type of foraminiferin, a group of amoeba that usually have shells or tests formed from calcium carbonate, the minuscule fossils of which are the major constituent of limestone. Unlike other foraminifera, however, xenophyophores do not have calcium carbonate tests. This is because of the extreme deep sea pressures at which they live, which is more than 1,000 times atmospheric pressure at sea level, any hard calcium carbonate shell would only liquefy. Instead, xenophyophores have transparent tests made from an organic glue mixed with particles of clay, minerals, the skeletal remains of other organisms, and other substances picked up as they move along the ocean floor. Hence their name, which, when translated from Greek, means bearer of foreign bodies. They are often more than 10 centimeters in diameter, and individuals of the largest species aptly named, Syringamina fragilissima, have been found that are twice this size. In contrast, other foraminiferans are commonly less than one millimeter across. Different species of xenophyophore vary widely in their appearance, ranging from flattened discs to spheres and from angular to frilly. The individuals of one species exist as a series of branching tubes embedded beneath the ocean floor. Like many deep-sea animals, xenophyophores are well adapted to the extreme cold and high pressure of ocean trench life, but are fragile and difficult to bring back to the surface for closer study. As a consequence, little is known about their reproduction and other behaviors. They are, however, very abundant in their natural habitat. In some regions of the ocean floor, as many as 2,000 xenophyophores have been counted per 100 square meters. Armor-plated shrimp well, not exactly shrimp, but rather a distant relative. Amphipods are small, shrimp-like crustaceans that can be found in most aquatic ecosystems. The thing is, they aren't really known as deep-sea dwellers. While it's true that some hardy specimens have been found in relatively deep ocean, their hard exoskeleton starts to deteriorate when they die below 15,000 feet. There, a combination of crushing pressures, low temperature, and higher acidity causes the calcium carbonate in their exoskeletons to dissolve, making them vulnerable to the pressure and predators. That's why it surprised scientists to discover a species of amphipod in the Challenger Deep, and the reason why they can survive there is something ripped straight out of medieval storybooks. Hirondelia gigas, or H. gigas for short, is the only known amphipod able to survive the 15,000 feet threshold. Scientists found that this extreme amphipod constructs a personal suit of armor, a layer of aluminum hydroxide gel covering the surface of its exoskeleton, but aluminum isn't abundant in ocean water, making it hard to source as a building material. It is, however, abundant in ocean sediment. To figure out how H. gigas accesses its aluminum, the team exposed sediment from the Challenger Deep, which the crustacean likely swallows when eating, to chemicals in its gut. Within that acidic environment, a byproduct of the plant in its typical diet reacts with the metal-rich sediment to free up aluminum ions. When these aluminum ions are released into alkaline water, they transform into protective aluminum hydroxide gel. To put it simply, they eat aluminum, they poop out aluminum ions, which then mixes with water. And then they turn it into armor. So in order to survive, they wear heavy metal poop armor. It's probably not like that at all, but I'm no scientist, and that's as far as I understand it. In any case, this aluminum armor appears to both relieve stress from deep sea pressures and prevent the amphipod exoskeletons from leaching calcium carbonate and disintegrating. Thanks to these findings, scientists are one step closer to understanding how it is possible to survive in one of the world's harshest environments. Finally, a whole lot of slime. If you're like a lot of people, you'll love the sensation of wet sand under your feet. 
You would think that the entire ocean would be covered with it, but you thought wrong. If you happened to keep swimming deeper and deeper and deeper, all the way down to the depths of the trench, the ground would suddenly feel very, very different. And that's because thanks to everything that trickles down from the miles above, everything in the trench is covered in a blanket of icky, viscous ooze. Sand as we know it doesn't really exist down there. In its place is, well, something that I could only describe as the remnants of death and decay. The floor of the trench is comprised mainly of crushed shells and the corpses of plankton that have sunk to the bottom over the years. Due to the immense water pressure, everything pretty much ends up ground into a fine grayish yellow, almost silky sludge. Considering how long the trench has been around, being considered by many scientists as the oldest part of the ocean, one can only wonder how deep the ooze floor goes down before Earth actually begins. Despite being a slimy mess, life still finds a way to exist down there. That part of the ocean floor is home to a very peculiar animal. Officially, it's called the Ocetix, and its name, as well as its feathery appearance, make it seem like a plant from a Dr. Seuss book. But this worm also goes by fiercer monikers such as the Bone Worm or Zombie Worm, and it can consume the rock hard bones of some of Earth's biggest animals. This includes whales. The Zombie Worm secretes acids to help it access the inner contents of those dead whale bones. Then it uses symbiotic bacteria to convert the bone's proteins and fats into nutrients that serve as its food. Its feathery branches wiggle in the water, pulling in oxygen to keep the worm alive. Fancy a trip down to the Mariana Trench? Let us know in the comment section down below. Want to watch more videos about amazing animals? Click on any of the videos you see on your screen. As always, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Later, everybody.